Today we hear some really stern words from Jesus about cutting off your hand or your foot or plucking out your eye if they cause you to stumble. It's easy to think we should, oh, uh, explain this, and we have to be careful we don't explain him, explain Jesus' words away. He speaks this way to get our attention because he has something really important, supremely important to say to us. So as we worship together today, we pray that we would open our hearts to hear what the Lord of the church would say to his people as we gather to worship in his name. Let's uh, turn our attention to the brief order for confession and forgiveness. Pastor Phil will lead us. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the God who fashions us, the God who heals us, the God who reforms us again and again. Amen. Let us confess our sin, calling for God's transforming power. Source of all life, we confess that we have not allowed your grace to set us free. We fear that we are not good enough. We hear your word of love freely given to us, yet we expect others to earn it. We turn the church inward rather than moving it outward. Forgive us, stir us, reform us to be a church powered by God, willing to speak for what is right, act for what is just, and seek the healing of your whole creation. Amen. God hears our cries and sends the Spirit to change us and to empower us to live in the world. Our sins are forgiven. God's love is unconditional. We are raised up as God's people who will always be made new. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Our opening song is 101 in the front part of your hymnal, the very front part, 101.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Generous God, your Son gave his life that we might come to peace with you. Give us a share of your Spirit, and in all we do, empower us to bear the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God miraculously provides manna in the wilderness, but the people crave meat. What, truly, what is truly needful? A reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 11. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites wept again and said, If we only had meat to eat, we remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Now the manna was like a coriander seed, and its color was like the, gum, uh, the color of gum resin. The people went around and gathered it, ground it in mills, beat it in mortars, then boiled it in pots, and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. When the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna would fall with it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we go? You have the words of eternal Jesus uses intense and memorable language when he wants most to be understood, when he most wants his words to be taken to heart. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 9. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. We tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Don't stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly, I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, Tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into the hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Let's sit down, the choir comes.
Think about this sentence for a minute, and then we're going to pray. But first we're going to think about this. Fill in the blank. Without blank, life just wouldn't be worth living. Without blank, life just wouldn't be worth living. I wonder if you just take 10 seconds, 30 seconds, turn to your neighbor and fill in the blank for each other. Just take a minute and do that. Without blank, nothing, uh, just life just wouldn't be worth living. Just try that out with each other. Okay. Let us pray. O oh God, help us with your wisdom to find the pearl of great price hidden in our daily lives, that which enriches us beyond measure. Help us know what to take hold of, what to let go of. Amen. There was a great TV show on the other night. I didn't see it. I heard about it from um, more than one person. It was about Mayo Clinic and the doctor, the, the Dr. Mayo and uh, the, the history of that wonderful institution. And apparently uh, they built this uh, medical and research facility up it was just fabulous, and they had all kinds of money as one of the most successful medical ventures in the country, but it never reached its peak until they began the cooperation with uh, the Catholic sisters who taught the medical staff about the values of love and mercy and hope and all the, all the virtues that we sometimes take for granted as part of our Christian faith, the fruit of the Spirit and uh, the things that Christ wants to lead us into as we value the person. A medical doctor can make the mistake of being an excellent technician and treating the disease, but until, the sisters said, until they learn to treat the person, honor the human being, in a relationship. They haven't yet entered the full meaning of being ministers of healing. Without faith and hope and love, we miss what life can be about. If we don't know what to hold on to, what to let go of, we can get into real trouble. In our country right now, we, have, we are losing something as simple as common civility with one another. The respect that we owe one another, not, not because the other person agrees with us, but just because they're a human being made in God's image. And our life together is descending into a hellish kind of abyss where it might, you might say, it'd be, be better if they just shoot us. Or Jesus would say, be better to tie a millstone around our neck and throw us into the sea. Because life can just get so miserable when we forget who we are and who the person is whom we are facing in our agreements and disagreements. What is so important to you individually that you would be willing to sacrifice your hand or your foot or even an eye for it? Is there anything at all that is worth more to you even than life itself? If the answer is no, there isn't anything more important than life, then uh, I would suggest you're not fully alive yet. If you don't live for something more important than your own life and your own possessions, your own power and position, you may become dangerous to our children to our planet, to our entire future. 
You don't know what to let go of. Where do you find that which is worth more than anything, more than everything? In Thornton Wilder's play, Our Town, Our Town, Thornton Wilder died in 1975. He was born in 1897. And Our Town was his most famous play. It's about a a young woman named Emily Webb who grew up in a sleepy New Hampshire town called Grover's Corners where, you know, nothing much ever happened. It's a little bit like uh, Jimmy Stewart in the, uh, uh, what was that movie? It's a Wonderful Life, yeah. Not too much happens in Grover's Corners, but Emily is happy there. She marries George Gibbs, who takes over his uncle's farm just outside of town, and the happy couple settles in. But when their second child arrives, Emily dies in childbirth. Such a sad day. And on the day of her funeral, she finds herself standing among uh, old friends and neighbors from Grover's Corners who have died before her. They're all standing in the area of the gravestones in the cemetery, and she's watching her own funeral. She sees Simon Stimson, the alcoholic choir director from her church who took his own life. She sees her, uh, she sees her husband, George's mother, Julia Gibbs, who had died. She sees her cousin, who had died of a burst appendix when he was just a boy, and she sees many others as well. They all have one thing in common as they stand there by their graves. They're waiting for whatever it is that comes next. They have this sense that their lives are supposed to be about something eternal. They don't know what it is, but they're waiting expectantly for something else, and their their gaze and their attention is heavenward. Even Emily, already so recently dead, she already feels a sense of detachment from her former life. And she turns to Julia, her mother-in-law. She says, live people don't understand, do they? Julia says, no, dear, not very much. And Emily says, I never realized how troubled and how in the dark live persons are. Then she spies Frank Gibbs, her father-in-law, Julia's husband in life. Look at him, she says. I loved him so. From morning till night, that's all they are, troubled. It turns out, however, that she can go back to observe a day in her former life, if she wants. Mrs. Gibbs tells her, of course you can go back. All I can say to you, Emily, is don't. Don't do it. All the others agree. It's not like you think it'd be, they say. If you must go, choose an unimportant day, the least important day of your life. It will be important enough. Emily returns. She chooses the day of her 12th birthday. It's early morning, February 11th, 1899. finds herself on her old street, and suddenly her old love of life returns. There's Main Street, she cries out. Why, that's Mr. Morgan's drugstore before he changed it. And there's the livery stable. Oh, oh, this is the town that I lived in as a little girl. And look, there's the old white fence that used to go around our house. Oh, I'd forgotten that. I loved it so. She sees Howie Newsom, the milkman, and their policeman, Constable Warren. She steps into her house, and there's her mother, Myrtle Webb, preparing breakfast for the family. Mar- Emily marvels at how young her mother looked. I didn't know Mama was ever that young, she says. Howie Newsom arrives, knocks on the door, steps into the warm kitchen with bottles of milk and cream. Good morning, he sings out, like he always does. Oh, it's cold. Ten below by my barn, and uh, Mrs. Webb, he says. 
In a few minutes, Emily's father arrives, her beloved dad. He'd been gone a few days, and he had just that morning arrived home on the early train from Boston. Myrtle, without even turning around where she's working on the stove, she says, how did it go, Charles? He says, oh, fine. I told him a few things. Everything all right here? And Myrtle says, yes. I can't think of anything that's happened special. Been right cold. Howie Newsom says it's been 10 below over to his barn. Coffee's ready when you want it. Don't forget, Charles, it's Emily's birthday today. Did you remember to get her something? He did, had it in his pocket. Suddenly, it's all too much for Emily. Ah, I can't, I can't bear it, she says. They're so young and so beautiful. Why did they have to grow old? And then she shouts as if they could hear her. I've grown up, she says. I love you all. I love everything. Oh, I can't look at everything hard enough. Oh, Mama, just look at me one minute as though you really saw me. Mama, 14 years have gone by. I'm dead. You're a grandmother, Mama. I married George Gibbs, Mama. But just for a moment here, we're all together. Mama, just for a moment, we're happy. Let's, let's look at one another. Mother keeps cooking, not looking up. Emily breaks down. I can't. I can't go on. It goes so fast, we don't have time even to look at one another. She moves to the door and begins to sob. I didn't realize all that going on, and we never, we never noticed. I can't bear another moment. And then she turns, looks one more time. She says, goodbye. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, Grover's Corners. Goodbye, Mama and Papa. Goodbye to the clock ticking, to Mama's sunflowers. Goodbye to food and coffee and new ironed dresses and hot baths and sleeping and waking up. Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful to, for anybody to realize you. What makes living worthwhile? Is it anything less than everything? But do we realize life while we live it, Emily asks. Do we realize life as we live it other than for brief moments here or there? We can miss life because we insist on keeping our hands and our feet and our eyes intact, our precious, shiny things, our honor, our reputation, our success, even our complaints, our good consumer dreams of someday, even our regrets, we can hang on and hang on and grow blind or bitter. And we cannot help ourselves, we pass these distractions on to our children as they look to us to learn what really matters in life. One might be tempted to argue that it would be better never to have been born. Maybe they should just shoot us. It's tempting to feel that way sometimes, except except that Jesus revealed a God who cut off his hand rather than lose hold of us, a God who tore out her eye rather than lose sight of you or I, her precious little ones. Jesus shows us in our own flesh and blood a God who sacrifices everything because God knows what makes life worth living. It's not the absence of pain or suffering, but it's the presence of love, and mercy, and caring, and devotion. Through death and resurrection, God keeps faith with his Son 
and with his son's people, with you and your children and your neighbors. God keeps faith with everything that matters to all of us. Little bits of bread, little bits of wine, little bits of daily life that we eat and drink almost without tasting it. God keeps faith. Hallelujah. Amen. The hymn 676 in our hymn book. We stand as we worship God. Now we pray for uh, the church and the world and all who are in need. God of grace, you have come to us in Jesus to teach us how to be present with the little ones and with all your treasures, all those vulnerable in our midst. Do not let our attention stray from the purpose that you give us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who drive out forces of evil, but who are not following us. Keep our hearts aware that you work beyond our own hands for the healing of your entire creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have been harmed by the church or hurt by church leaders who strayed from your will. We ask for healing to any who may have been hurt in this place. Let us abandon ways of cruelty and become fully the household of healing that you desire. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the churches of Eau Claire as we get ready to be your hands, collaborating in your work on October 14th. May this event remind us of our purpose and may it show to the world your compassionate heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that those who call upon your name might live peacefully with one another. Let our mutual respect reflect your kingdom. And let our mutual correction be always done in love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are in need of shelter, or food, or hope and healing. We pray for the victims of the recent tsunami in Indonesia. We pray for victims of violence and hatred everywhere. We pray especially for those places and people whom we name before you now.
Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our brother and friend. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us share this peace.